That's right. Ship them up here in a minute. Sure. She's talking to Jackie. Jackie and her back Thank you. 
Sometimes the march can seem a little wearisome, uh, but you have to look and realize where you're headed. And, you know, if you keep your focus on Zion or eternity, you can keep on marching no matter what happens. And it's just great to be able to live for the Lord and to be able to march in this march and to be able to realize we're headed toward a city. Good to have uh, visitors with us again. Uh, the Hornets. Uh, Children, grandchildren are with us today. Good to have our visitor back from this morning. That's a blessing. Come all the way from Texas, uh, but moved up here to Ottumwa. So uh, we're glad for that. And again, I appreciate all of you that came out uh, yesterday and just had a good turnout for knocking on doors in agency. Um, really, we've got all but about two streets done in agency. So we'll go back next Saturday and, and just get the cleanup uh, done there. But a smaller town, but we need to get out and get the gospel to the littler towns as well and just make sure uh, that everybody has a chance. Everybody needs to hear. Uh, um, and so every door got a John Romans and a gospel track. And whether they were home, whether they were not home, if they're home, we get a chance to talk to them a little bit. And some people had some uh, some possible prospective uh, visits. So um, it, it just was a blessing. And I was so glad to see a good group turn out for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Uh, for just the opportunity to be here tonight, uh, to have a group of people that want to come back on a Sunday night to hear your word preached, uh, to sing praises to you, God, to give you glory. Father, we're glad that you have put us on this road to Zion. Father, we're thankful to be able to participate in this life knowing that you're with us and that we can walk with you and have fellowship with you here. This is technically your land. Uh, it's yours because you, you purchased it, you bought it, you created it. It's all yours. And Father, we're here passing through, ready to go on to be with you. God, help our service tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've also got Luke Armacost visiting with us. Um, and he's going to he's kind of stay until camp. So he was already in Iowa, and they dropped him off. They didn't, said, we can go home and practice this empty nest thing. Um <laughs> Until, until they get back here. So we're glad to.
Thank you, choir. Appreciate that. Page 247. Another song we haven't sung for a while, but a good song. I understand it was born out of a revival meeting and somebody was there who lived a hard life, didn't think God could ever save him, but all of a sudden in the middle of the preaching, he started to shout out, save, save, save. And then uh, I believe it was Schofield, Jack Schofield wrote the song. Uh, having been there in the service and seen what happened, wrote this song. Let's sing it. Verse number one, I found a friend. I found a second here to catch your breath you can lose it on some songs all right all right we're going to stand together if able we're going to let the choir go down when poor and needy and all alone in love he said to me come unto me and i'll lead you home let's sing it verse number three together ready when poor and needy Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, I got the end notes on the first verse. I squeaked on the second, and by the time I got to the third, I dropped an octave. But it's a great song, isn't it? Have you found that friend? Um, I'm glad that I have. I just had the opportunity from about 4.15 to 5.30, participated in Jason Brown's ordination service over in Nebraska. I uh, had to do it via uh, face. FaceTime, I guess it's called on, what is it? Apple phone is FaceTime, right? Yeah. Um, so FaceTime, I don't like technology that much, but we uh, uh, did it and I uh, had his official ordination there. And uh, it's just, it's just a blessing to see what God's doing in his life. He grew up here, was away from the Lord for a period of time and came back and is full on fire for God and has been for um, since about 2006, I think, I think he said. So God's, God's really done a work in, in his heart and life and brought him now to be a pastor of a small church in uh, Columbus, Nebraska. So that was a blessing. Uh, teens, laser tag, Quincy Place Mall, Tuesday, June 8th. It'll be 6.30 p.m. Just meet there. Um, and there'll be laser tag and pizza. And this is going to be taken care of by the teen fund. So it doesn't uh, cost you anything, mainly for teens, but uh, open invitation to the whole church family. So if you want to come and play some laser tag, you're welcome to come. Uh, young ladies wear skirts or culottes below the knee. Young men wear polo or collared shirt and jeans or slacks. And please let Adam Batterson, 
right here know by today if you hope to come. If you need a ride, please let him know and we'll arrange that. And so just make sure, have most people let you know they're coming? And not so not so much. So um, make sure, make sure you do that. Um, I'll tell you what, why don't you stand up? If you think you're coming, will you just raise your hand so you can get a general idea? Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I'll probably come. Brother Blue, you coming? Come on. I mean, what's more fun than shooting people and them not dying? All right. The laser tag, folks. Those that are live, it's laser tag. We are not talking about the real thing here. Okay, just so. Um, okay. And then uh, Friend and Neighbor Day. There are flyers out there June 27th. And it'll be uh, our regular service times, but take some flyers. And again, this is not just to mass distribute. This is you think of and pray about a specific neighbor or two or three or some specific friends. Take this flyer to them. Give them a personal invitation to come out to church. And really what we're looking to do is invite people that are not saved or maybe people that uh, go to a church that doesn't preach the gospel anymore for one way or reason or another, and just try to get them to come and, and be praying about it, invite, and then there will be a barbecue following the service that day, a time of fellowship. We're just going to grill some hamburgers and hot dogs. Um, we will have some potato salad. We'll get a sign-up sheet out for that and some brownies. And basically, we want people to come and then have a chance to just get to know people a little bit. And it gives you an opportunity as their neighbor, as their friend who invited them to spend a little time out back with them and just talk, communicate, build a little bit more of a relationship with them as your friend and neighbor and really, really work on that, pray about that, and we'll talk about it more upcoming. And then all those going to camp, we will meet next Monday, not tomorrow, but next Monday, 10 a.m. in the parking lot. We'd like to be ready to go as close to 10 a.m. as possible, so come just a little bit early, and then that'll be Monday morning, June 14th. Tonight, following the service, there will be a quick meeting with uh, Brother Reed with all of the TBT Bible lesson teachers uh, after church in the choir room. And so continues to be a the main need for a four-year-old teacher and a couple of assistants for four- and five-year-olds. And then be praying for Vacation Bible School, Temple Bible Time uh, there in July. So we'll be looking toward all of those things. Let's have our ushers come as they're coming. Um, Justice, why don't you come pray for us, please? Let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us today, Lord, as we are here to um, hear your word, Lord. Please help us to learn something tonight, Lord. Please help us have open hearts, Lord, in your name. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Katie. Page number five in your songbook. Page number five, please. When I survey the wondrous cross is the name of the song. We need to think about our Lord and what he's done for us. Page number five. Sing it together. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died, my richest king, I count not loss and for contempt all my pride. Open your Bibles, please, to Numbers chapter 32, Numbers chapter 32, and we will look at 8 through 14 uh, to begin with this evening. And we're, we've been looking at, uh, on Sunday evenings for a few weeks now, I believe this will be the sixth one, different things that provoke God to anger. And we obviously, we are designed for what purpose? Our purpose of creation was we were created for his pleasure. Um, and we want to please our God. We want to please our Savior. But all through the Bible, there are different things listed that have provoked him to anger. And so we want to avoid those things, and we want to look at those specific things. The Bible says in chapter 32, verse 8, Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up unto the valley of Eshel and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. Whose responsibility was it to get them into the land? It was the Lord's. He had given it to them. Uh, they didn't, you know, they were going to go in, they were going to fight the battles, but who was fighting for them? It wasn't the Israelites that tore down the walls of Jericho. And so it was God's gift to them. They refused to take it. The Lord's anger, verse 10, was kindled the same time. And he swears, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swear unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob. Uh, that 20-year-old, it's not a random number. Uh, I believe that a person comes out from under the accountability of their parents as far as authority-wise when they turn 20 years old. I know that in society, they say 18 years old, they can vote, they can do all of these things. But uh, the people that were over 20, they were accountable for the decision not to go into the land or to go into the land. And so all of those over 20 died. Everybody that was 19 and under, they were fine because it wasn't their decision. We look, it says, because they have not wholly followed me, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Ken Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. And behold, ye are risen up in your father's stead, and increase of sinful men to augment yet 
the fierce anger of the Lord toward Israel. I'm going to look at this topic tonight, the topic of rebellion, the topic of rebellion. I, I had this one. I was going to preach this one next week, but we, we preached on self-will last week, and this ties, I believe, so closely together with that. I wanted to put these two uh, together. So let's pray, and we'll look at the scriptures tonight. Father, we seek your help tonight. We seek your understanding of the Word of God, and we seek your moving in our hearts to help us. God, we uh, truly, I believe that the people that are here, they wouldn't be out here on a Sunday night if they didn't want to hear something from your Word. But God, every one of us need to be encouraged to follow it. Father, every one of us has a self, a flesh, a self-will, and sometimes that self-will overflows into actual acts of rebellion. And Father, I pray that you would help none of us to be living in the state of rebellion. God, help us to have hearts that would be submitted to you. And God, help us not to provoke you to anger. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go back to Numbers 13. We'll get the background on this. He refers, refers very specifically to the fact that they didn't go into the land. But Numbers 13 is the original story of how this happened. Verse 31 says, But the men went up with him, said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched under the children of Israel, saying that the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. And all the chill, congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Be careful what you wish for. Uh, they did get that, would God we had died in the wilderness? Well, God gave that to him. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return unto Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only, and here we see the word that we're looking at, only rebel not ye against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. Easy how quickly people turn on people that are following the Lord, isn't it? And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation for all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. So this is the setting of the story. God's instruction, God's command was go into the land. They went into the land to take a look. That's not a bad option. Go in there, spy it out. But when they went in and they came back, they came back realizing we can't do this. That's also not a bad place to be. You know what? How many of you can actually live the Christian life apart from Jesus Christ? I, I can't. I'll tell you what. You put aside the Bible, you put aside your walk with God, you try to live the Christian life for a little bit in your flesh. It doesn't work that well. And so for them to be able to look at that land and say, we can't do this, that's not a bad place to be. Just, okay, but God can. And don't forget that when you look at something and you say, I can't do this, don't forget that God can do it. And God is able to do it. So let's look at rebellion uh, and get a little bit of a, a definition of rebellion. Uh, first, it is an open and avowed renunciation of authority of the government to which one owes allegiance. 
So rebellion, self-will, is you coming out and basically your own self gets in the way, you do things your way. Rebellion, it takes it a step further where you're openly saying, I'm not going to do that. And it is, it is more outright, it is more forthright, it is more of a, you can't tell me what to do type of a situation. God told these people, go into the land. They said, we're not going to the land. We can't go into the land. They openly disobeyed God, a direct command of God. This is beyond self-will. This is rebellion. This is to the point where we're going to turn around and go back to Egypt. We're not going this way anymore. Go to Joshua 1.18. Joshua chapter 1, verse 18. Joshua is giving some instruction here. The instruction that he's given as he gives, uh, Scripture continues in the stead of Moses to give laws, to give what God has for them. And in Joshua 1.18, the Bible says, Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment. Now, this is the people speaking, talking about the commandments that Joshua is giving. The commandments that Joshua is giving are coming from the Lord. Remember, a preacher doesn't ever just preach his own authority. You preach the Word of God, and what's in the Bible is from God. Well, the preacher said, no, the preacher just preached the Bible. And you do need to verify they preach the Bible. It, it's, it's here, and that's why we want to open the Scripture, go to the Word of God, and, and clearly show this is what God expects. This is a thus saith the Lord matter. So whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. So rebellion is going against the known word or the known commandments of God. We have a Bible. We're able to open it up. Most of the Bible, you read it, it's pretty forthright. It's pretty straightforward. You get into Ezekiel. Yeah, Ezekiel's a bit of a tough book. We will eventually tackle the book of Ezekiel here. It, it's a tough one. Uh, it's not the most, the easiest book to go through. Um, some parts of Revelation, trying to figure out the timing of different things, and some of it you can't completely do. But there are plenty of things in the Word of God that it's just a straightforward, this is what God said. And don't we have enough trouble just following the straightforward things sometimes? Why? People by nature are self-willed, and then some people go beyond that. They're just plain rebellious against the things of God. Now, should a Christian ever rebel against the Word of God? The answer, obviously, is no. We shouldn't rebel against the Word of God. But let me just ask, how many of us have sometime or another known very specifically what God was telling us to do, and we said no? I'm not asking for a raise of hands, but the fact is, is probably any one of us could raise our hand and say, yeah, and sometimes we can point very specifically to this or this or this when, and, and, and we're not talking about a failure of the flesh. We're talking about when we purposely and forthrightly decided that we were going to disobey what God said. That's rebellion, going against the word of God. Go to Job chapter 24. Job chapter 24. And verse 13. Job 24, verse 13 says, They are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the paths thereof. Now, there are certain things that are very specifically given in the Word of God. It's absolutely black and white. You cannot make a case to go against it without just being in rebellion. And then there are things that are clearly, not laid out as clearly in the Word of God, but as you read the Word of God, it gives light and life into your, your soul and your spirit. And there's some things that you can't take a verse... But you can look at a person and say, you knew that was wrong, right? 
There's light. There's light given from the Word of God into your conscience. There are things that's just like, you know that wasn't the right choice to make. And th that also is rebellion. So you've got rebellion against the specific Word of God, and then you've got rebellion against light that is given in the light of the Word of God. But maybe it's not a specific command, but, but you knew in your heart that really wasn't the right choice to make. And then go to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15. First Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23. Here the Bible says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Now, stubbornness was the first thing that we looked at that provoked God to anger. It's amazing. You take stubbornness, self-will, and rebellion. They are three very unique things, but aren't they so closely tied together? They really are very closely tied together. God says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, what was the scenario here? God told Saul, go to the Amalekites and kill everyone and everything. All the cattle, children, kings, all of it. Saul went in, and they did most of that, but very specifically, they kept the king alive, and they looked and said, boy, that's a good beef. Oh, I, I want, and they kept some of those things for themselves. Now, what is that? You could look at that and you could say, did Saul, and I want to just lay it out, did Saul mostly do what God said? Yeah, probably about 97%, right? What did God say Saul did? He rebelled against God. See, 97% isn't good enough. Now, I'm not trying to be discouraging and say, well, how in the world I can't do 100%? Look, this was a specific command given to Saul. The command was pretty simple, wasn't it? Kill them all. When Saul decided to keep the king alive, to keep those specific oxen and sheep alive, he very specifically said, I know what God told me to do, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do my own thing. That's rebellion. And God looked at that and said, that is the same thing as witchcraft. Now, that's pretty heavy. Witchcraft had a death penalty put with it. So this rebellion, when God says it's the same thing, Saul, for this thing, you say, but he did most of it. Look, God isn't looking for you to be a 95% Christian. This provoked God to anger. Saul lost the kingdom. This affected him and it affected his generations from then on out. This one decision of rebellion. So rebellion can be very vocal. Saul did not go out here and say, I am going to disobey God. He just didn't do it. So rebellion can have two Two things. It can have, be very vocal, like Korah back in the Old Testament, where they absolutely rose up against Aaron and Moses and that whole situation. The earth swallowed them up. Or it can be subtle, where they're told what to do and they don't look at it and say, No, I'm not going to do that. They just don't do it. So there are two levels of rebellion. One is a vocal, forthright, in your face rebel, and one is a subtle, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just not going to do it. And I'll be frank. The easier one to deal with is the vocal one because the other one can be sneaky. This one's obvious. We know we have a problem. This one can look the part. They just don't do it. This is hard to deal with. This is pretty open forthright. This one you look at and you're on your knees saying, God, we have a problem here. We, you, you can be right there forthright with them. Say, look, there's a problem here. 
Uh, this one, you might miss it for some period of time. And so we look at it open and loud or low and murmuring. You see it both sides in the Word of God. Let's look at the causes of rebellion. The causes of rebellion. Go to Isaiah 1 2. First, we're going to look at the negative sign. What is not the cause of rebellion? People can look different ways. And they can say, well, I know I'm a rebel, but it's because of this. Let's look first. And at this point, you cannot blame rebellion on your upbringing. You cannot blame rebellion on your upbringing. Let's look at the scriptures. Isaiah 1, 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, we could look at human parents, and we could say, yeah, they weren't perfect. Here, God said, I have nourished and brought you up. Does God fail? Now, I can fail as a parent. Uh, you can fail as a parent. Your parents have had failures as a parent. God never failed. Let's look at another chapter here in Isaiah, uh, chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. Look at the scripture here. And I want you just to let sink in here the what is described as the loving kindness of God. Verse 7, Isaiah 63, verse 7, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he hath bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. That's pretty good, isn't it? Would you call God a perfect parent? Sure. You would definitely look at it. Would you say that God ever failed as a parent? I understand that the children of Israel are not his physical children, but he refers to them as his children. He refers as he has chosen them. God has showed them his loving kindness. Verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their savior. That's pretty good, isn't it? Has God taken pretty good care of you? And in all reality, young people here tonight, do you have pretty good parents? If you think that you don't have pretty good parents, you should go sometime and I'll show you some of the parents that are out there in the world. And let me just say this. Your parents may not be perfect, but you've got pretty good parents. If you're here in this room tonight, and I, I, I know the parents of uh, a lot of people in this room, some of you older people, I don't know your parents. Um, they've passed away. They're already maybe with, in heaven with the Lord. But you look at this, you got pretty good parents. And God was a pretty good to these people. In verse 9, look at this. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. Do you know what? When the children of Israel were suffering, it was hurting God. You know, this is the classic of you get ready to spank your child and this is going to hurt me as much as going to hurt you. And I never told my kids that because I never believed it when I was growing up. Um, but you have to look at it and you have to say, you know what? When your children are hurting, it hurts you. There's something about it. And God is saying, look, I love you. My mercies are toward you. My goodness is toward you. You're my people. I've chosen you. When you were afflicted, it, it hurt me. It afflicted me. Do you get the spirit of God toward his people here? And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He bare them and carried them all the days of old. That's pretty good. Now, what was their response to God's perfect parenting? But they, what? Rebelled and vexed 
his Holy Spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy. Now, sometimes young people, they get looking at their parents and say, I'm a rebel because of something they did. Look, if you're a rebel, it's because it's in your heart to be a rebel. Don't blame your parents. Definitely don't blame God. Just acknowledge you have a heart problem, you have a sin problem. It's your problem. See, this nation of Israel, they couldn't look at it and say, oh, it's God's fault. They couldn't look at it and say, God didn't love me enough, or God didn't spend enough time with me, or God didn't this, that, or another. No, God had done everything for them. It was in their sinful nature to rebel. And we don't want to be... Rebels, you cannot blame rebellion on your upbringing. So what caused the rebellion? Let's go back to Numbers 13, 33. Numbers 13, 33. Numbers chapter 13, verse 33. It says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, the sons that come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Fear can cause rebellion. You notice it's addressed in verse 9 twice. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. See, Caleb and Joshua were looking at the situation, and they understood the reason this person, these people are not going in is fear, and they addressed that issue. You know, fear, there may be somebody that was called to be a missionary. They didn't go because they were afraid. That's rebellion. If you know God told you to go someplace and to do something, you don't look at all the circumstances surrounding it. You go because that's what God led you, God guided you to do. So I'm afraid. We'll get to the next point in just a minute. But this thing of fear, you know, sometimes people won't go out and witness because of fear. It's just, I, I, I just can't bring myself. I don't know what they're going to do. Look, we go out, we knocked on the doors in the agency. Uh, anybody besides us have a door slammed in our face? Anybody? nobody, I mean, in agency yesterday, um, you had one, you had a half one and we had one. It really wasn't that many. You know, most people are not vindictive and, and the guy that slammed it, he didn't even let us introduce ourselves. So maybe he just thought that we were Jehovah witnesses, um, or something like that. It's not like, Oh, it's about us. You know, he had no idea who we were. It's just, we're, my wife's standing there. It had to be because of me. It definitely wasn't because of her. Um, but you, you look at it, and some people never get to actually go and do that thing that God tells us to do, and they don't go because of fear. Some people, they, they may not give what God tells them to give because of fear. See, there's a level of fear and there's a level of faith. So rebellion can be caused by fear. The next one, rebellion can be caused by a lack of faith. These two are so intertwined together, you can't hardly separate them. And I'm even having trouble preaching the two separate points without them crisscrossing one another. But Numbers 14, verse 8, if the Lord delight in us, now let me ask, did the Lord delight in them? Yeah. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. Okay. Faith. Joshua and Caleb, do you suppose that they saw the same giants the other ten saw? Yeah. You know what Joshua and Caleb said? The bigger they are, the harder they fall. You know, they're looking at it saying, you know what? God crossed, opened the Red Sea and let us walk across it. God had done so many things for the nation of Israel there, why would you doubt him? But let me ask, is it sometimes easy to doubt God? Why would we doubt him? Often it's fear. 
See, you, you got you got faith or you got fear, which is really the opposite of faith. And so you look at it and you think about it. Rebellion can be caused by a lack of faith. Numbers 32, verse 9. Look at this one. Rebellion can be caused by peer pressure. Numbers chapter 32, verse 9. Numbers chapter 32, verse 9. And when they went up unto the valley of Eshel and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel. You got 10 men coming back saying, there is no way we can't do it. There's giants in the land. And they're telling that to the entire congregation. Those 10, they got back. That message went throughout the group. You got two saying, no, we can do it. But where was the greater pressure coming from? 10 Verses 2, and the 10 used their pressure on the congregation, and the congregation followed along with it, and you could just see that building as the 10 told people, and then those people told people, and those people told people, till pretty soon the congregation, they are so intent on the fact that we can't do this. When Joshua and Caleb stand up, and say, yes, we can. Let's go into the land. Don't fear. God's given us this land. They literally were going to stone them. They wanted to stone them. Look, that's just the way peer pressure works. People get in a group. Some people in the group put pressure on others in the group, and you may have one or two over here that say, no, that's not. And the group turns on the couple people that aren't going to do it. It's peer pressure. That's what took place here. And rebellion can be caused by peer pressure. Let's go to Jeremiah 26, 28, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 28 and verse 16. <coughs> Jeremiah 28, verse 16 says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth this year. Thou shalt die because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Do you realize there's people out there ready and willing to teach your children to rebel against God? There are people out there actively trying to get people to rebel against God. The, the whole topic that we dealt with this morning, the two genders and only two genders. Where does this whole philosophy come from? People out there pushing that rebellion against God. And it's exactly what it is. And God says, thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. Chapter 29, chapter 29, Verse 32. It says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah, the Nehelamite, and his seed. He shall not have a man to dwell among this people, neither shall he behold the good that I will do for my people, saith the Lord, because he hath taught rebellion against the Lord. Now, in both of these cases, the punishment for teaching people to rebel against the Lord is pretty severe. God doesn't look lightly on that. But the fact is, there are people that will try to convince other people to go against the truth of the Word of God and the light that has been given. This is an active process. There are people that have been pulled into every kind of sin by peer pressure. People that would not have gone down that road if they weren't with that group. And so what does God say? How do you deal with this? First, um, before we get there, let's go to uh, Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9. So Nehemiah addresses this very incident as they come back into the land. Remember, why were they in captivity? Rebellion against God. 
starting all the way back at Kadesh Barnea, going all the way through. And Nehemiah finally gets the people back in the land. Ezra had brought them back. They rebuilt the temple. And then Nehemiah comes back. They rebuild the wall. And Nehemiah says in chapter 9, verse 17, and then verse 26, it says, And refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks. And in their rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Even when those people went into the wilderness, God still loved them. God still cared for them. Verse 26, nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee. Now look at the phrasing here. And cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets which testified against them and turned them to thee, and they wrought great provocation. It's interesting. You get a group of people, the peer pressure is on. You get a prophet that comes along speaking the word of God saying, no, no, don't do that. No, that's not right. And the crowd turns on them. In many cases, they even killed the prophets. Isn't that interesting? It is amazing when people are teaching other people to do wrong. It is amazing when someone stands up to that group. They are pushed down. They are belittled. They are made light of. And they are made to look like, yeah, you just get out of here. It happens all the time. So how do you deal with this? Go to Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 38. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 38. There's really only one way to deal with it. Verse 38 says, I will purge out from among you the rebels. See, rebellion is catchy. People that are rebels always want someone else to rebel with them. They like the numbers. They like to build. And so God says, I will purge out from among you the rebels. What has to happen? You know what? If you want to have a good youth group and you've got a rebel that is becoming prominent in that youth group, you know what? It's better to remove the rebel. Well, but look, it's poison that will overflow to the rest of the group. It just does. If you're a parent and you're looking at, at, at a situation, you say to your child, say, look, you can't be around that person. They're a rebel. They're going to influence you in a wrong way. There are times when you just have to purge away the rebel. Now, you may do it by pulling your child this way, and it's never a matter of, you're too good to be with them. No, that's just stupid. That's garbage. That's prideful. It's a matter of you recognizing, I don't want my child to be taught to rebel. I'll tell you, it is such a danger to have large groups with low supervision because all it takes is a rebel or two to start a movement among a group. And it doesn't matter whether it's a public school or a Christian school or, or a church youth group or what it may be. Rebels teach rebellion. And they have to be purged out. Now, Numbers 32, back to Numbers 32. So here's the situation. You got 10 spies teaching rebellion, putting on the pressure, using fear and a lack of faith. And basically, they've got the entire group going their direction. 
here's the thing. You do not have to go along with a rebellious crowd. 32.12, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenzazite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they wholly follow the Lord. Two guys, two people. That's it. You got the entire group, and Joshua and Caleb are saying, let's go into the land. And you know what? Who were the only two people over the age of 20 that made it into the land? And, and how old was Caleb when he took that mountain? He was up there, 85, was it? 85 years old! But he still got that mountain. You don't have to follow the peer pressure. You don't have to be influenced by rebellion. You can stand against that. Now, God knows how to turn rebellion around. Go to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. So we've got rebellion defined. We've got the causes of rebellion. And the fact you don't have to go along with a rebellious crowd. But what, what if there's a rebel there? Look, God knows how to bring a rebel around. Look at it, Psalm 107, 9 through 15. He satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. That's our good God, isn't it? Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. So they rebelled against God. They took the counsel or the word of God, said, I don't want anything to do with it. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. You get a rebel, say, well, I just want to help them. Sometimes the best help you can do for a rebel is let God deal with them. See, what was it that caused the rebel in this psalm to turn back to God? God had to bring them down. And when they got low enough and they looked around and there's a very key phrase there, there was none to help. If you're a parent, that's hard, isn't it? You get a child that goes astray and God's dealing with them. Maybe, maybe it's an adult child. God's dealing with them. And just like the children of Israel, you see a child hurting. It afflicts your own heart, doesn't it? It's real easy. Oh, you know, I'm going to come in. I'm going to help them. Why did they turn back to God? When God brought them down, the fact that, that turned them back to God is there wasn't anybody there giving them a handout. The prodigal son, there wasn't somebody there bring, giving them a handout in the hog pen. That's what woke him up and brought him back to God. And it is key that you let God accomplish his work. You let God do what he's going to do. God knows how to bring the red rebel along. And then lastly, rebellion needs to be confessed and forsaken. Lamentations 120. Lamentations. Lamentations 1 and Daniel 9. Lamentations 1, verse 20. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me. Now, why did all that happen? For I have grievously rebelled. I've grievously rebelled. See, God was working. Here's a person in some form or another. They weren't doing what God had told them to do. And God was seeing to it that things just weren't going very well for them. 
if things aren't going very well for you, it's a good time to step back and say, I just want to assess. Am I in some way rebelling against God? And I am, am I in some way not doing what God wants me to do? Now, just because things are going badly does not necessarily mean that you've rebelled against God. Okay, so don't take that wrong. But, but it's a, still, it's a good time to step back and just assess things. And here the person confessed and turned back to God. Daniel chapter 9, verse 5. Daniel prays here, talking about his entire nation. Remember, Daniel's over in Babylon, a captive. We have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. If you have departed from the word of God, say, I'm just going to do my own thing. The only thing that's going to fix and get things back on the right track is you acknowledge the rebellion and turn back to God. See, rebellion, often it entails a specific sin. I'll do this, I'll do this, but I'm not doing this. Often it, it, it entails a specific sin, but really what it is, it's a heart attitude toward God. Because when the heart gets right with God, that sin becomes a non-factor because you'll walk away from it. You know, there may be a struggle in the flesh. There are people that sin, and when they're done sinning, it's like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to do that. God, help me not to do that again. That's not a rebel. That's a person who, who broke. That's a person who, because of the weakness of their flesh in whatever moment that they were involved in, they fell into that. They, they, they sinned. And they're sorry for it. And they didn't want to do it. But then there's the person that does it, and they do it again, and they do it again. And you could have a person go to them and say, hey, you know, you can't be doing this. Well, I don't care what you say. I don't care what the Bible says. That's rebellion. And rebellion is something. It's, it's a heart thing, and it has to get taken care of in the heart. It has to be dealt with in the heart. You can never fix rebellion by just bringing outward actions into line. You can never take a group of young people and try to say, okay, let's get everybody back in line. If the, if it's, if the heart is not fixed, you're never going to be able to bring them back into line. It has to start here. There has to be a confession. There has to be a brokenness. There has to be something with, with God dealing with them to bring them to the point where they're broken, where they're confessing, where they're looking at it saying, God, I am sorry. I have been wrong. I've committed this sin. But the reason that I've committed it is because I was rebelling against God. And don't just deal with, oh, God, I'm sorry for this sin. No, God, what caused me to do that sin and do it again and do it again? And deal with that rebellious heart. Deal with that thing in there that is turning you against God or turning you against a parent or turning you against a, an authority of any time, kind or turning you against the very word of God itself. Well, I'm just not going to change in that area. Why? Has God ever really asked you anything that was not for your benefit? Has God ever really given you a command that was designed to hurt you? Remember, God is that whole description. He's loving, kindness, merciful. Do you know what? People, they get all wrapped up in, in different areas of rebellion. I'm going to do what I want to do in my dating. I'm going to do what I want to do. In my, you know, you get into, it's a rebellious heart that looks at and says, I'm just going to do my own thing. Who cares what the Bible says? No, let's get back to the scriptures. Because God designed, the scriptures are there for your benefit. 
They're there to help you all the way through. May God help us to not provoke God to anger like these, the nation of Israel in this case. All, all of us, we, we need to, from time to time, search our heart and say, God, is there anything there that you're telling me to do and I'm refusing? Sometimes God comes along and something's brought up in a message or something's brought up and the Holy Spirit says, how about that? And at that moment, we have a choice. Submission to God or rebellion against God. And it ultimately, it's not the outward action. It's, it's what takes place here. Because the outward action is just a manifestation of the inward heart. Let's stand to our feet. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Let me just ask anybody that tonight would just say, Pastor, God spoke to my heart tonight. I have some things that I may need to work on. Anybody at all? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's pray and we'll have an invitation. Father, I ask that you would help us. Father, this is a heart matter. And God, just like stubbornness and self-will and pride, all of these are heart matters, but they're all things that provoke you to anger. And Father, we don't want you to be angry with us. We want to walk in sweet fellowship with you. God, I pray that as your word has gone forth tonight, God, that everyone that needs to make a decision would make one. God, that you'd work in hearts. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As the piano plays tonight, do you have something to come and pray about? Anybody that just wants to come and open your heart to God? Often we think of, when we think of rebellion, a lot of times we think of, and it, it comes across as a teenage thing. But this group that rebelled against God, were they weren't teenagers. They were 20 and over. There's no doubt. As the word of God goes forth, that the Holy Spirit talks to his people. Father, we thank you for just the time to be here tonight. And God, I again pray that you would help our heart's desire to be to please you and to love you. And God, may, may you mold our hearts, help them to be submissive hearts. God, help us when we struggle. God, that we would learn to follow you. But God, help us to learn that it's not just a matter of putting outward things into uh, correct order. But God, dealing with that heart matter so that the outward just falls into place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.